I'm Jennifer Bilbrey. This is On Our Minds, a monthly podcast about psychotherapy in Austin, Texas. Today I'm interviewing Michelle Bowles. Michelle works with highly intuitive people and specializes also in working with couples. Today we're going to talk about what being highly intuitive means and about the unique way that Michelle works. Michelle, you work with highly intuitive people. Explain what a highly intuitive person is. And especially I'm interested in the difference between what being highly intuitive means and what having like good intuition is. Yeah, so that's, it's, it's going to be a bigger answer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so all highly intuitive is, is really a way of identifying yourself. If somebody identifies with that term, then they can apply it to them. Certainly no one has a, there's no litmus test for being highly intuitive. Okay, no quiz. You exactly. You can take online. Okay. <laughs> but I wanted to explain to people in a more linear fashion what it means to be intuitive because I didn't find that that was really out there for people. Like mm. if people identified as intuitive, where what does that mean, yeah. right? And so I wanted to define it for the people who aren't intuitive who are logical and linear and mm. want to understand ah, it. Okay. And I also want to define it just to validate. It's a thing. That it's a thing. So when I went to understand what is intuitive, I went to the dictionary and I found these definitions and I found them to be demeaning. Mm. Most of them would say things like the ability to perceive and understand something without fully realizing why. Oh, and that sounded like someone, you know, yeah. is kind of an idiot uh-huh. a little bit. <laughs> or it would say, uh-huh. like, without um, the ability to reason or make an inference oh, to something. Like and, there's reason and there's intuition. <clears throat> exactly. Uh-huh. And um, and I just I felt like these definitions weren't very good definitions for yeah. me. They, you know, so I, so I started to dig deeper and I looked at the OED which is the Oxford English Dictionary, okay, the old you. one. Okay. And its definition said that it's this ability to perceive and observe something uh, relatively easily, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And instead of saying um, the other phrases, it was said without the intervention hmm. of a logic or a reason. Okay. Which I think is important. So going to like, what is logic, right? Well, logic is simply using a framework Mm -hmm. to filter data through. So you have this framework about what's true, like say the scientific method or mathematics or economics, and you filter data through it and either it's true or it's false. Right. Right. So we use logic to, and we apply that to data and it's like a sieve and only the good data comes through. And then, so some things are wrong and some things are right. And, um, this is, you know, this is really important, right? This is the essence of multiple choice tests in school, true and false, and all this deductive reasoning, okay. right? What's okay. true? What's valid? What um, intuition is, is, is knowing what you're experiencing or what you're observing. And rather than not using reason, we can still use reason. We can still apply logic to what we're experiencing, but it's not intervening before we know what we're experiencing. So with reason, right? It's not oh, saying, "Oh discounting. no, that couldn't be true because that's not logical." Okay. If we experience it, then we can say, "Well, there's something here. I'm observing something. I'm knowing something," and so it's and about. And I can not, pay attention to that, and that's yes. valid. Just and it's as, valid just because I'm experiencing it. Okay. I don't have to know what it means yet, but ah. then I can run it through a logic filter uh-huh. later and decide if it has validity or not. Okay. Oh, I love that definition. Yes. Yeah. So that was... I I really like it because it doesn't counterpose reason and intuition. Right. There are two different processes that can be used as appropriate. Both valid. Yeah. Both legitimate. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's the definition for intuition. Okay. Um, I also like to talk about the etymology of it. All right. Okay. So this is what did the word mean originally? What's the yep. ancient meaning of the word? Yep. So it in the word intuition is tuition, which okay. is, we think of that as like the money we pay for an for, education. Right. But what it really is, is the act of educating. 
So oh. that's sort of like the people in the UK will use tuition to mean that, to mean the act of getting an I education. I did not know that. Okay. And then within tuition is tutor, right? To tutor someone. Uh-huh. And so tutoring. To teach. Yeah, to teach. Mm-hmm. But also the ancient meaning was to be a guardian of. Oh, that, like mentoring. That's right. The tutors, you had apprenticeships. You didn't just okay. teach knowledge, but you were in charge of all of their care and well-being. Oh, wow. So intuition is an inner tutor who's in charge of our oh, well-being. That. It's oh, an that gave me chills. inner I love it. guidance system. Okay. So our intuition is this inner guidance system mm-hmm. that's meant to teach us mm-hmm. and guide us and protect okay. us. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's like what, that's what intuition is. Okay. And then what does it mean to be a highly intuitive person? Yeah. That, the way I define that is that highly intuitive people have three natures. And by nature, I mean, this is just our natural way of being and experiencing the world. The first one is receptivity. So we're very receptive to Mm. getting information in all kinds of ways. Okay. There are three traits that I talk about as being receptive. Like Michelle, more flexible in how we get information. Well, it, it varies with different people. So okay. I want to talk about the three traits. Okay. So the three traits of being receptive are a sensory sensitivity. Mm-hmm. So that would be a sensitivity in one of your senses. And that would include the sixth sense, ah. right? ESP. Mm-hmm. But it would include More sensitivity, hearing, tasting, smelling, visual. And then within those sensitivities, you could have like um, when your your visual sensitivity may be that you experience the world more 3D, right? Or it may be that you just get a lot of visual information in or it may be a light sensitivity. Or it could be a sensitivity to color. Like lots of different variations and then even within there you can have multiple sensory pathways so when i hear music i experience color that goes with the notes i was just thinking of synesthesia yes yeah okay so that's another sensory sensitivity all right um i was just interviewed for um a documentary called please be quiet on misophonia which is means hatred of sound oh And this is somebody who is very sensitive to sound and certain types of sound cause them psychological distress. Okay. Like 80% of misophonias um, or misos as they sometimes refer to themselves uh, have a real aversion to the sound of chewing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So sensory sensitivity. So you're receptive to some way that information's coming in, you know, through the neocortex, mm-hmm. through the cortex, into the brain, and you're just getting a lot of that data. It could be that you're, you don't have good filters, like mm. your brain, and that's not a bad judgment call, but just right. you don't filter out information. Mm-hmm. Or it could be that you just have a really intense antenna. Uh, you can really pick it up. Okay. Some variation of those different things. On either multiple levels or one thing specifically. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So there's a greater receptivity in the senses. Okay. Then there's empathic entrainment. Mm. That's the second trait. Which I love is, that word, entrainment. Yeah. I've always loved that word. I do too. <laughs> I do too. I had to squeeze it into one of these yeah. traits. <laughs> but that just means, you know, to become in sync with one's environment, right? To attune to. And so empathic okay. entrainment is that you're going to feel other people's feelings, you're going to pick up on feelings either that they're having now or that they've disowned. Mm-hmm. That you're going to somehow get information about them, either literally feeling them or somehow knowing that something's going on with them. Okay. It might be that you have a visual sensitivity. You notice that their skin flushes. Uh, mm-hmm. Could be, you know, that you feel it somewhere in your body. Mm-hmm. Somehow you get that information and yeah. you sync up into it. Okay. And this is sometimes why highly intuitive people leave environments drained because uh, they will sink into the high energy of a Kia and uh, all the sensory stimulation, wow. but then leave just exhausted. Oh, wow. Okay. And it could also be that they just collected a bunch of information, a lot of emotional disowned information from the people there. From the people there. Mm-hmm. And so now they have to find a way to discharge or metabolize all the emotions that they picked up. Okay. I know you have a third one, but I want to come back to this. No, go ahead. Well, I'm thinking about um, 
that happens to me in Ikea or even at H-E-B at the grocery store. That's right. Someone on aisle three maybe lost <laughs> someone they love and you yes, picked up their yes, stuff. Yeah. And it's taken me a long time to get to the place where that's acceptable, where I can kind of think about that idea as somewhat legitimate. You know, yes. I still have trouble with it. But I've thought about that as high sensitivity. Well, there's really, I mean, in my opinion, anybody who's highly sensitive is likely intuitive. Okay. But the reason I go to intuition yeah. is because not everyone who's intuitive would identify as highly sensitive. Okay. That somebody like myself, I, I do identify as HSP, but I have warriored up. I have... Uh -huh protected myself because of my childhood history right. from vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And so I present more ADHD. And, and so, you know, there's a, I'm highly intuitive. I certainly have a sensitivity, but I don't maybe look exactly like HSP, like you might think. Mm -hmm. um, so Steve Irwin is a great example. You know, the crocodile hunter. Do you remember him? Oh, Yes. Huge sensitive, right? Really? Can read animals, can talk oh, to sure. animals, yes, right? That's right. But you don't think of him as being highly sensitive, sensitive in, that, no. in that frame. Right. So I think uh, um, yeah. highly intuitive people, it, it, it's a little wider berth. Yeah. Now, Elaine Aaron's work is amazing. And I think over time, she has started to realize that her frame of highly sensitive people really fell more under introversion uh -huh. and she's it's tried amazing. to make room for the extroverted sensitive. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. Right. And so I think we're really talking about a lot of the same thing. Okay. But I just want to bring intuition into the conversation. Yeah. She mentions it in mm -hmm. all of her work yeah. as HSPs being very intuitive, Yeah. but still doesn't define what that means. So that was sort of where I feel like my contribution is, is let me define what that means to be intuitive. Okay. What I find so helpful about Elaine Aaron's work, especially with the couples I work with, mm -hmm. is that there's a source I can point to that says there is research here. That's right. This is legitimate. This is valid. If you're not the if you're the non HSP living with an HSP, you can know this is a real thing. It's not. I'm not making it up. Right. She or he's not making it up. Yes. Yeah. What, what, I want to talk about that. Okay. Do you want to talk about that now? Yeah, let's talk about it. Okay. Um, so I'm super ADHD, so I'll come back okay. to those other traits Great. and we'll keep Great. going okay. in just a little bit. <laughs> so in my work with couples, what I have found is that if one person is that HSP, how I think about that is that's like an archetype of the poet, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of mm -hmm. archetype. Mm -hmm. And they're usually paired with the archetype of the warrior. Mm -hmm. And that the warrior is equally sensitive, mm -hmm. but they have just a different adaptation. Yeah. And that they have these gifts. So they come together because they both feel a little invalidated by the world. Yes. Misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And here you find somebody and, oh, you understand me. Mm -hmm. And you have all these gifts that I have lost touch with. Mm. And so we can come back together, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what all good couples and Ideally. relationships mm -hmm. um, are meant to do, I believe, is to bring us back into wholeness. Yes. And that our partner carries our lost parts. Yes. So the poet's lost part is power and voice. Okay. The warrior's lost part is vulnerability. Yeah. And empathy. Okay. So oh, when I'm it. working with couples, <laughs> if I can help the HSP develop voice, and a sense of validity and a sense of empowerment. And I can help the warrior um, person develop a sense of compassion and empathy and just slow down a little bit. Mm. Then we can come into wholeness mm -hmm. and grow. Mm -hmm. Well, say more about how to do that. Because one of my questions was, how do you create a culture in your family or in your marriage that encourages both parts? Right. What's well, a big question? Yeah. Right. And yeah. this is why therapy takes a long time. Yes. <laughs> you know, because it can take. And it's expensive. It can take a while <laughs> uh -huh. to, to bring us into wholeness. Yes. Right. Yeah. To stretch a little bit every day. Mm -hmm. um, I use the Imago Dialogue process, be, which is a you know complicated thing I won't go into, but it takes 
Each partner takes turn fully entering the other person's world yeah. and understand Lovely. why they adapted the way they adapted, mm -hmm. where vulnerability was dangerous in mm -hmm. that warrior's history, mm -hmm. where having a voice and being empowered was dangerous mm -hmm. in the HSP's family. Mm -hmm. And then as we Ooh. kind of enter each other's world, we start, it just changes us. It transforms us mm -hmm. through that experience, just like watching a movie can be transformative. Mm -hmm. So I help the couple really get into each other's stories okay. and feel into the stories. Mm. And as they do that, they also reclaim not only the lost parts of themselves, but they reclaim um, sort of a sense of partnership and teamwork mm -hmm. that, you know, sure. it's good we're different. Yeah. Yeah. This is helpful. Very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. And just kind of leveraging those differences mm -hmm. for what makes sense for you as a couple. Yeah. I'm thinking about the warrior that walks into the office uh, so completely armored mm -hmm. that it's like there's no how, you know, so with some people yeah. I find like, I don't know, where is the, how do, where is the soft spot here? Where, how do I? Yeah. Well, it's one of those things like, all that's there to protect them. Yeah. So I just honor it. And the more you honor it, the less it's needed. Uh-huh. So it, you don't push. You don't yeah. look for okay. the soft spot. Okay. You just honor and uh -huh. mirror and validate. It's great that you, um, your feelings don't get hurt that easily. Oh. You've got a thick skin. Uh-huh. And that must be really helpful for you in the world. And it makes sense that it might be hard to see how this person can get hurt so easily. And, and it might be a little even scary to see how easily they get hurt. Yeah. Right. And, right. and, and then, you know, over time when they feel like I don't need to take that away from them, it slowly starts uh, to yeah. come off uh -huh. because the truth is, is people want to be, seen and vulnerable they yeah. just need to know that it's safe, safe yeah and that if they need to armor up again really quickly that i'm going to be Let like it. yeah put it on uh -huh. let's go <laughs> i yeah. get it uh-huh i was thinking how helpful that would be for the poet to hear her. yes it's i mean that's really i think the ability to enter each person's yes. world okay. as a therapist yeah. And fully get it mm -hmm. and honor it and honor the way they had to adapt mm -hmm. and honor why they had to put away those parts. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, helps the couple. Ju it just normalizes everything. Okay. So this brings me to a, like a burning question I have for okay. you about how you mingle more traditional psychotherapies with um, what you're talking about now. And in particular, I'm thinking about modern analytic ways of yeah. practicing therapy yeah. and how um, in some ways non-intuitive, I mean, in, in the ways that you've described, it can be, how, how very heady. Well, that's, I think our culture has, has it swings, right? Things swing uh -huh. and, there's, and there's trends and there's what's in style. And so I like to think of a modern analytic or analytic or, you know, the way Freud or Jung or um, Winnicott or other of our forebearers, forefathers practice. I like to think of that the same way I think of ancient wisdom. Okay. Right? It's mm -hmm. ancient and it's mm -hmm. wisdom. Mm -hmm. And there's parts of it that we can bring forward and apply now. And there's parts of it that may be archaic. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. And that it's very hard to know what somebody meant. Mm -hmm. at the time when they were writing because they were writing in the thought patterns and language of the time. Mm. So um, I think it's really important to be classically trained in because? therapy because this is the wisdom. Why would you throw out all the wisdom that people have honed over yeah. years and years? I mean, okay. the reality is, is that I will never be at my best as a therapist until I'm probably about to die. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so why would we take all this wisdom that somebody <laughs> has cultivated over 30 years of practicing yes. okay. and take it uh -huh. in and see how it fits for us? 
So for me, modern, one of the key uh, techniques for modern is called joining, mm -hmm. which is exactly what I was talking about with the armored person, oh, right? I, sure. You join them. Yeah. You get why they are the way they sure. are. You celebrate it. And then they yeah. don't need that defense. Uh -huh. And that's the language of modern analytic. Yeah, okay. And modern analytic would, would talk about intuition as counter-transference. Uh -huh. It's the feelings I'm aware that I'm feeling. It could okay. be images I'm having, ideas, urges. Okay. Anything that I'm experiencing, I interpret as being about you. Yes. When I'm sitting with you. Yeah. For the sake of your therapy. I don't make it about me. Right. Right? Yeah. So that's induction, uh -huh. um, that's intuition, but analysts will talk about it in different language. Yeah. So Freud would have talked about it one way, Carl Jung would have talked about it another way. Right. Um, I just take that language and then I adapt so it to who I'm speaking with. Uh -huh. It's so helpful to think about induction and transference and counter-transference as intuition. It is. It's just intuition cleaned up because uh -huh. intuition got a bad rap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it got a bad rap. Most of the traits, if you look at like Myers-Briggs, most of the traits that Freud did not identify with got a bad rap. So introversion got a bad uh, rap. Yeah. Intuition oh, gets yeah. a bad rap. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. You're right. This uh -huh. logic, linear, medical model yes is what was validated by our culture mm -hmm. at that time in kind of the West, mm -hmm. Western culture. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's making me think of uh, times when uh, I'm with a client and or a friend or, or myself, and I hear, um, it's just my intuition is telling me uh, not to do this or to do this. And, and uh, where as a therapist or friend, I can... I'm thinking that I don't know that that's intuition. That I, I'm thinking that might be fear, yes. or something else entirely. Yes. So how do we know? We don't. Yeah. Okay. That's the art, <laughs> right? That's the art. Okay. And that's what people spend a lot of time in therapy trying to develop. How, okay. How does it feel when my mind is telling a scary story versus versus how does it feel when I'm getting a yes mm -hmm. or I'm getting a no in my body? Okay. Now, I want to come back to the traits real quick. Okay, great. Because the third trait of receptivity is somatic knowing, mm -hmm. which is honoring that your body talks to you. And your body talks to you, we, you know, no, feeling something in your gut is a very common way of speaking about intuition, mm -hmm. right? Right. But it can also be heart knowing. Mm. We have a lot of um, neuro neurons around our heart mm. as well as in our brain and so we get a lot of data yeah. around our heart knowing mm -hmm. also skin knowing mm -hmm. goose pimples mm -hmm. right skin right. crawling yeah um and in uh the fascia that holds all of our body together in our muscles we can have tension mm -hmm. we can get tension in our neck and oftentimes when a client's talking about a right. difficult person in their life they'll right. start yes. rub i'm like are they a pain in the neck yes right <laughs> yes. did they stab you in the back uh -huh. like so there's all this information that is somatic knowing that is information coming through the body and when clients tune their body knowing that helps them determine the difference between okay. a scary story that's coming through the mind yes. and an intuitive way of experiencing something that's a no. Yeah. No, don't don't get in the car right now. Yeah. Okay. And that it takes a lot of work to sort through all of that. Sure. And uh, so much awareness. Um, yes. Yeah. And I think group therapy is the most powerful way of tuning that up. Oh, say more about that. Well, I want to just start with you need a feedback mechanism uh -huh. to tune your intuition. All right. You need somebody validating your experience and helping you explore it. And so therapy is really powerful for that. Mm -hmm. But then when you put group and you put a whole bunch of people in the room who you're not paying mm -hmm. and they can start giving you feedback mm. and sometimes it'll hurt your feelings and mm -hmm. you'll be like, no, this is real for me. How come you misunderstand me? But if you're in a good group therapy setting, mm. you get to work through that. You got to have all your experience about being misunderstood. They may come around and change their mind. They may not, but you, you learn to 
have your full range of emotions and all your thoughts mm. and somebody in group is going to validate you mm-hmm. and you start to kind of tune up that intuition and also develop some insulation of not, not in training with everything mm. like you can entrain with people but then you can come back to you insulation because of the other group members who might be joining you yeah it's um I think of emotional insulation is what's going to protect you from gathering up too much emotion that's not yours, right? Uh, like, you need that insulation to go, that might be about me, but mm, that's, you know, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. It's, it's mm-hmm. kind of buffers you from other people's thoughts and opinions. Is there something about group that helps a person know that difference, that this is about me or that this is about them? Well, in a good, well-functioning group, people are talking about everything going on in their lives, which is very different than the office, yes. families, yes. even friendships. Right. Right? Sure. And so when somebody comes into the room and they're sad, they're going to talk about what in their life made them sad. And then you're going to tune your intuition like, oh, I was feeling I was feeling that when they came in. Mm-hmm. Oh, that belongs to them. Mm-hmm. Let me put that back with them. And now I can look at what's left. What am I sad about? Mm-hmm. And you start to do that sorting because you're talking about everything. Yeah. And you need a place where people are talking about everything to tune your intuition, to develop that so feedback that mechanism. Wow, mm-hmm. oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think because I work with a a lot of highly sensitive people, that uh, feels like a place that people struggle with, that I struggle with, of knowing what's mine and what's somebody else's. There's no way to know unless you're in a healthy system where people are free to talk about everything. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. And we are so... And we just don't grow up in a culture... Bereft of those kinds of healthy systems. Right. So... Not every group therapy is a healthy system, mm-hmm. but if you find one that is, yeah. and you have leaders who can metabolize all the affect, invite it all into the room, mm-hmm. join with everything that shows up in the room, you create that environment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love that idea. Yeah. I, I never made that connection with group therapy. So, so we've talked about the nature of receptivity, right? Okay. And you have the three traits of receptivity, which is empathic entrainment, sensory sensitivity, and somatic knowing. Mm -hmm. The second nature is connectivity. Okay. So now we get all that data in, right, Mm. from wherever we got it. And now what our mind does is it makes connections. It makes associations. Mm -hmm. So we have the trait of associative thinking. Okay. This is metaphor. Ah. This is, um, you know, this is like this. This is putting two things that may seem disparate and making a connection between them. Like, um, well, water is like a car because they both move. Okay. Right? Uh Associative thinking. Then there's also abstract thinking. Mm -hmm. So this is the ability to take one element out of something and make um, make it something else. So um, artists use abstraction, right? Mm -hmm. It looks... Like kind of like a tree, mm-hmm. but it also could be like a feather mm-hmm. or it could be something else. You know, it's very abstract. So um, highly intuitive people tend to uh, go to the abstract very easily. Um, they go, and so they go to symbol mm-hmm. very easily. Like $20 is not always $20, mm-hmm. right? C- concrete thinking would say, well, $20 is $20. An intuitive says, well, it depends how much is in my bank account, how much do Mm -hmm. I want to spend it, Mm -hmm. um, how am I feeling today? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's relative. Mm -hmm. It's abstract. We can abstract money. Okay. can make it more symbolic. Um, And then the third trait of connective thinking is generative thinking. Sorry. Mm. So this is the ability to generate lots of possibilities rather than deductive thinking, which is the filter, right? What's the right answer? Uh. Generative thinking is using a lot of associations, a lot of, oh yeah, and then there's this, and then there's that, and what if it could be this, and what if it could be that? And Mm -hmm. we're always thinking about all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And so one idea like snowflakes out into many branches of thought. 
So we hear, like, movie trailers are a great example. If an intuitive person is sitting in the movie theater and we start watching the trailer, our mind goes, oh, what if that's going to happen? What if this? It's like we start storytelling with just a few bits of information. And then we go, oh, that's not where they were going with that. But that was really interesting. (laughs) Okay. So um, this ability to take the information and then make even more connections and do even more with it it's why intuitive people tend towards feeling overwhelmed ah. and really anxious. Yeah. They have like a brainstorming brain yeah. that's always on and yeah. always making connections, but that also lends itself to innovation, mm-hmm. very creative thinking, new, new ways of putting things together. Mm-hmm. So that's the second nature, connectivity. Okay. All right. The third nature is visionariness. Which I think is a very cool word that no one uses. (laughs) It is. It's an ability to, the first trait in visionariness is envision. So somebody who can envision something that doesn't exist. Okay. They can envision what the past was, like what it looked like. Like think about Mad Men and building the sets uh and like recreating a world that you didn't actually live in. Mm -hmm. Then you have the um, future oriented envisioning which is what we're most familiar with but it can Mm. also be like inventions and Mm. new science and new breakthroughs in medicine and ability to take all that data that you've connected and now make meaning out of it okay to create significance to the patterns that your brain is imagining the second trait under that is contemplativeness Mm. so highly intuitive people are very contemplative they want to know why Mm. they want to look at beyond the facts to the deeper meaning or Mm -hmm. the deeper significance of the patterns Mm -hmm. that their mind is perceiving and then the last one is a passion for significance Mm. so this is somebody who really likes um steve Irwin's a good example somebody who really likes um, feeling something very intensely and having uh, a transcendent experience like through trance or meditation or it could be drugs, it could be storytelling, okay. right? But mm-hmm. they're seeking um, significance mm-hmm. in the data that they're perceiving and they want people to transform or change or be inspired, I'm just thinking about how helpful it could be for people with a lot of anxiety uh, to hear this frame. Yes, it is. It's 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 so, so healing. Yeah, it's so validating. Right. Yes, and it's so validating. So when I present this at conferences, people will come up and they'll say, oh, I bet. "Like I I get it now. I get who I am." Yeah. But also, I kind of get my partner. And I get that of these nine traits, Mm. they have these and I have these. Mm. So the poet is more likely to have that empathic entrainment, Mm -hmm. um, sensory sensitivity, somatic knowing, very receptive, Mm -hmm. right? But sometimes the person who's tapped down their sensitivities, amped up, their passion for significance, their envisioning, their Uh connectivity. Uh So, you know, it's like they still have all those traits in there, but it's just maybe different mixtures yeah. of the traits. So yeah. yeah, very validating. And it's I think it's terrible that this model has not existed. Yeah. That, that this isn't um, talked about, this isn't normalized. No. I mean, the first time I heard about it was from you and on your website. Yeah. 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 And then... Um, The other thing that's important just to talk about when we're talking about highly intuitive people is how invalidated we are. Okay. Um, That this, I call it the invalidation wound. Uh huh. Yes, I heard you present on this early. Yes. Mm -hmm. And starts with being a little kid and having some kind of information in your family Mm -hmm. that your family didn't want you to have. Maybe you sense mom and dad had a fight, or Uh one of them is sad, or yeah something and as a little kid you've just enough language to say mommy why are you sad yeah and mommy in an effort to reassure us i'm not sad says oh honey no see i'm fine fine. and then you get this crazy making what the yeah what do i do with all of the somatic knowing or this way i'm getting this information yeah and you're in charge of my survival right so i have to believe you. you so i have to put this away somehow yeah 
And that's where we get that wound. And it creates a lot of very negative adaptations for highly intuitive people. Okay. So we are overrepresented in eating disorder clinics, yeah. alcohol, drug treatment centers. Sure. Um, Any so, addiction, probably. Right. Because yeah. we have to find a way. Well, this, so the way to think about this is when you have an invalidation wound like that, and now you have to start paying attention to external sources mm -hmm. of information right. more than internal sources. Right. So I call it being externally organized. Mm -hmm. So now I have to ask you, well, what color is yeah. that? What or, should I do? Or Michelle, am I the right weight? Am I the right weight? Yeah, All of that. You, yeah. And we start looking for external yeah. ways of measuring right. that we're okay. Mm -hmm. The scale. Mm -hmm. um, it could be finishing my plate. It could uh -huh. be... Um, how much money is in my bank account? Yeah. How many friends do I have on social media? What do you yeah. think of me right now? It right. could just be anything in the external environment is now my compass. Yeah. And of course, I'm going to get different directions from different people. I'm going to feel lost. I'm going to start to develop a lot of loneliness. Yeah. Feeling different. Yeah. Feeling misunderstood. Being often told I'm too sensitive uh -huh. or the way I think is Boy, that's appropriate a big in school. One. Yeah. And so I get invalidated outside of the family. Maybe it didn't happen inside the family. Maybe it just happened when I went to school and mm -hmm. I noticed my teacher seemed sad. Mm -hmm. Or the kids next to me were, you know, their parents were going through a divorce. And I picked up on that, but they weren't talking about it. I mean, yeah. it's, it, we're steeped yeah. in invalidation. Yeah. And then we have to become externally organized to get data to on survive. how to be good and yeah. how to be right, yeah. how to survive. So one way to adapt to that is to become very dependent on material things to tell me I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Another way to adapt is to get people to tell me I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So codependency, mm -hmm. right? Another way is to numb it out. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, addiction. Mm -hmm. And another way is to become like antisocial and not care what anyone thinks. Oh, interesting. And become completely... Um, Isolated, yeah. almost um, uh, like uh, what's the term? Schizoid. Like oh yes. Like just uh -huh. no information's coming in. Yeah. Right. And so I lose my relational capabilities. Yeah. Be to protect my sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So those are just the four main ways people adapt to the invalidation wound. I think it's more like people who are who have had to protect themselves and bury their sensitivities that would be, would not identify with HSP because they have an aversion to sensitivity that will maybe find a home in this identity in I was thinking and move towards this. In understanding their own sensitivity. As you were talking, I was thinking this, that when some people come into my office and I'm thinking they're highly sensitive, but there's something in me that knows uh, that's not going to be okay to say or to have in the family system right now. Well, and a lot know, of the men I work with are, um, they're, if they're engineers or whatever, uh -huh. they, you know, they're rewarded for their logical and linear exactly. side and this sensitive, empathic side that it gets lost. But over time in group, uh. they become really, uh, you know, they demonstrate a lot of empathy and they mm. read people accurately and they get that feedback mm -hmm. and they start to reclaim this part of themselves that they awesome. may have felt a little out of sync with. I think not only for men do are they so rewarded for like this logical side, but also um, I see it a lot, not knowing even when they're hungry, like being so disconnected from bodily sensations that it's hard to know I need to eat right now. That's right. Well, that's that external organization. Ah, okay. Yes. Right? Okay, that makes and sense. And that, that yeah. the, the individual has to journey back to reclaim their internal sense mm -hmm. of knowing. Yeah. Right? And that, that's, that's what real recovery from an eating disorder is, mm. is really reclaiming that connection. So Anita mm -hmm. Johnston's work, Eating in the Light of the Moon, uh -huh. uh, really yeah. she was the one who inspired me really? on my whole journey. Okay. Yes. Yeah. She, she is the one who really helped me understand that 
she found that people in eating disorder in her clinics, the one thing they had in common was not trauma, like how she thought it would be, sure. because that was really the training of the time. Mm-hmm. But it was actually that they're all very highly intuitive. Wow. And that it was being denied knowing oh, what their gut was telling them, uh-huh. right? That started making them rely on external sources for, am I hungry? Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Michelle, thank you so much. This yes. was fascinating. Um, if people want to learn more about high, high intuition, being highly intuitive, um, where can they find you? At michellebowles.com. Okay. B-O-H-L-S. That's right. Dot com. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for interviewing me. I'm Jennifer Bilbrey, and this has been On Our Minds, a monthly podcast about psychotherapy in Austin, Texas. 